Oh, sing a new song to the Lord, all the earth. Sing a new song, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Amen. Let's sing to God's praise from Psalm 135. Exalt the Lord, his praise proclaim. Let's sing together. redeeming us out of the nations, redeeming us as your heritage. Father, we pray that you would magnify the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts, that his gospel and his salvation, uh, we would behold it, and we would love it, and we would find all our sufficiency in him and all our satisfaction in him. That, you, that seeing the world with redeemed eyes would lead us to see more of its beauty. Would you grow us in our love of heaven as we worship you today? Would you hear the prayers that we offer to you now using that form of prayer that Jesus gave, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily
Let's confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed this morning. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, Turn to page four and we'll confess our, our sin uh, together using the prayer printed in the bulletin. Let's, let's all pray together. Merciful God, we humble ourselves in your presence, confessing our unworthiness and sinfulness in your sight. We have broken your holy law. Please be seated. The assurance of pardon comes to us this morning from the same text that was our encouragement to give last Lord's Day, reminding us of uh, both uh, the, the joy and, and, and generosity that God has given to us in the gospel, uh, but also what it cost him. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, may become rich, pressing home upon us. How great a transformation God has worked in us and saving us and restoring us to himself, taking we who are destitute and making us rich before him. And having received his riches, I hear these words that encourage us to respond with generosity from our whole self. On the first day of the week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as you may prosper. Amen. Well, now let's... Let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray together. Most gracious, most glorious, most merciful and exalted God and Father, we do praise you for your steadfast love. You are on our side. You have cut off our great enemy and brought us to yourself. Worthy are you of all glory and honor. You possess all dominion and majesty, and yet you enable and instruct us to call you Father. So we may confidently bring our petitions to you, knowing that you are not only able to help us, but are willing to show your fatherly care toward the children you have bought and paid for to adopt into your family. Father, would you please show mercy to this land? You have commanded your people of old uh, to seek the welfare of the city of their exile, and so we do for our own, and in our own exile. We know that this land is not our home, this country is not our country, because we are seeking a heavenly city with foundations. And yet we do grieve because of how this land is again being shaken, not only by pestilence, but by lawlessness. Lawlessness both by those who are called to enforce justice and promote peace, as well as by those who feel like victims. Father, we hear people cry out for justice, and yet we know that if you were to give justice, if you were to mark iniquity, 
who among us could stand? Surely this land is a wicked land before you, for it has murdered the fatherless. It has allowed doctors to kill unborn children for convenience. It has created a system in which the poor are abused by the powerful. It has tolerated leaders who promote murder, injustice, and violence against the defenseless. And now you are letting this people see the fruit of rampant wickedness in government, in education, in commerce, in entertainment, as the cities are burned. And yet, Father, would you please show mercy to this land? You have given this people a sampling of what sinners deserve. And so would you enable us, your people, to show mercy and grace to the hateful, to the angry. Please enable us to comfort the downcast and the lonely, to care for the vulnerable. Grant us leaders who will love righteousness and hate evil, who will speak wisely and build up rather than destroy. We thank you, our Father, that your gospel is for all sorts of people. We pray you would sustain your church in Africa this week in Mauritania as they persevere through poverty and affliction by Muslim oppressors. Father, hear the cries of your saints as they mourn for their loved ones brutally murdered, and yet enable them to show mercy to those who do not deserve it. For such are all of your people, undeserving objects of your abundant mercy. Our Father, we thank you for the partnership we have in the Smoky Mountain Press. Would you grant blessing to their pastor, Bill Fikes? Give wisdom and to their session as they move toward reopening. Preserve their unity to enable their membership to value the love of Christ's body over personal preference and convenience. Father, we lift up Mark Hassan and Metanoia Ministries as they are kept from the prison still because of this pestilence and unrest in the land. Thank you for Mark's testimony of your saving grace and mercy toward him. Thank you for the redemption that you provide. Would you enable Mark and those among this congregation who go into the prisons weekly and now who continue to maintain the fellowship and friendship with the men in the prisons through letter writing. Would you use those relationships and friendships to fortify those men in, in your grace, both inside the prison and outside, that they may love you for what you have given to your own people. Father, we thank you for Rachel Bynes, her fellowship and frequent presence here at First Press. Would you sustain her and her work in Chattanooga? Thank you for bringing her back here. Would you protect her family in Minnesota? Bless them as their congregation reopens as well. Would you grow, Rachel, in love for Christ and godliness, meeting her needs and granting her full contentment in the Lord Jesus Christ? Father, we thank you for the deliverance from crippling pain that you have given to Lance Wood and to Elaine Bossart. Would you bless Lance as he returns to work? And yet Bob Keller and Mary Lou Wilson continue their struggle with back pain. Would you provide relief for them that they may be freed from this affliction? And yet in affliction, let them know your sufficiency and beautiful salvation from the curse of this life. Also, we pray for young Ren Hauser who comes with Marion and David Cobb. Would you relieve her agony as she awaits surgery? Enable the doctors to fix her broken leg. Grant that she and her whole household will know your abundant salvation. Remember Marcy Tuggle's sister, Bonnie, as she goes on hospice care and continues to receive some level of chemo treatment. Would you make her well prepared for the days ahead to rest in your gospel promises? Grant her Full assurance of faith. Comfort Marcy and Dolores and their mother, Miss Faircloth, as they are weighed down. And yet we are bold to pray for deliverance from this cancer. For we know you are merciful, and we trust you because your will is always good. Father, we thank you for Joe Wilson, his leadership amongst the youth here as they go to serve our members and others in the community. Would you shield them from harm and enable them to enjoy the work that they do? Teach them of your truth. Strengthen the bonds of unity they have as Christ's people. 
Bless Joe's teaching and instruction so that these young folks may be filled with the knowledge of Christ. Hear us, we pray, our Father, and do all things according to your will, for Christ's sake. Amen. Let's stand and we'll sing to God's praise from Psalm 95. One of the, some of the words we've been hearing banded about in society are biblical words, biblical concepts, and yet we often understand those words in a worldly way by remaining fixed in the Psalms, fixed in the Scripture. We fortify ourselves against worldliness. So let's sing together from Psalm 94. Exodus 14, there is the sure and certain reminder that those who do not find refuge in the Son, who do not kiss the Son, will be immersed in God's judgment. And so Israel is at the Red Sea. It's an idyllic scene, really. You have um, seaside, ocean waves lapping against the shore. A large group of people, actually two large groups of people who have come to the sea for baptism. And that is where we pick up here in Exodus 14. I'm going to begin at verse 10. But let's pray before we read uh, God's word. Father, as we approach this glorious text of your salvation and your judgment, 
Would you comfort us with the assurance of pardon and of your covenant mercy that we have already received as we see as we see Pharaoh's hosts drown. And yet would you preserve us from arrogance and haughtiness because we have known your salvation, for that is what we deserve. Would you grant us gracious humility? Because of all we have, all of it we have received from you. And so, Holy Spirit, speak to us in the scripture. For Christ's sake, amen. Exodus chapter 10, uh, chapter 14, beginning at verse 10. When Pharaoh uh, drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, so that they shall go in after them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horses. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove back the sea by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land. And the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord in a pillar of fire and a cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots of the horsemen and all the hosts of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord has used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant, Moses. Amen. Thus far in God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. God has placed his people in an impossible situation, hasn't he? For the purpose of glorifying himself in saving his people and in judging their enemies but also to give them confidence that they are completely free from their enemies. And so I want to see with you in the first place absolute confidence, verses 13 and 14. Uh, I think the technical term for what Israel is doing here is freaking out. Um, 
They have just seen, though, remember, they've just seen God's power displayed in a dozen different ways, haven't they? At least a dozen ways. They've experienced the benefits of God's faithfulness to them intensely. They have witnessed the ten plagues and the other signs from Moses previous to the ten plagues. And then their luggage is weighed down, right? They go to the, they go to the, the, the TWA station and they put their bag on there and it's 57 pounds. And they open it up and what's in their luggage? Jewels and gold and Armani and Louis Vuitton and all sorts of valuable garments. They're leaving Egypt wealthy, even though last week they were slaves stuck in the brick pits. All of this because of what God has promised to his people. But now they're fearful. They're ready to kill Moses. They're grumbling and complaining, complaining because they think they are going to die as they see the Egyptian army and Pharaoh approaching. And they let Moses have it because he brought them out of Egypt to die in the desert. And some people, they, they read Exodus 14, and, and they push back, and they say, well, look, this, is, this, this definitely wouldn't have happened. It's totally unreasonable for Israel to have, have acted this way. Uh, they, they, look at all they've seen. Nobody would be this foolish. Nobody would doubt that, that God brought them out to die. Uh, so the Bible must be untrue, they say. Obviously, God didn't do all that he said that he did in Exodus, because if you had seen all of those things, you surely wouldn't get to the ocean and then think you're going to die. So they say, well, you, you can't trust the Bible. Maybe that's a fair criticism, but I think it's pretty ignorant. In reply, I, I would respond, well, obviously those people have never taken kids on vacation. Obviously they've never taken kids anywhere fun. Have you ever done that? What, what happens on that trip, right? Some time ago we were at this theme park infested with giant rodents in central Florida. We got up early. We made our way to the gate. We parked. We finally get through the gates. And we've been through the gates for five minutes. And then what happens? I'm hungry. I need to eat. I'm tired. This is heavy. Are we ever going to eat? I'm starving. And we've just brought the kids to Disney World, and they're complaining after five minutes. I'm going to say, well, of course you're going to eat. Do you think I brought you to Disney World to feed you to the giant rat who runs the place? No, we're going to find something to eat. But that's part of our fallen, depraved nature, isn't it? We are prone to doubt, prone to complain, prone to grumble at the very first sign of trouble or discomfort. No matter how illogical, no matter how silly it is. And so it should not surprise us one bit that Israel is complaining here. In fact, Israel's complaints and doubts being recorded here should give us all the more evidence that the record of Exodus is true. Because if you're writing your national history... You don't record the bad parts, do you? I want to look, look at what Moses does not do. Number one, Moses does not panic. He simply holds firm and fast his confidence that God will do exactly what God promised to do. Bring them to the promised land. But also what Moses does not do, by the way, is call for a prayer meeting. We don't even have a record of Moses praying right here. In response to Israel's charges and accusations. So one of the things Moses does not do right here is pray. Israel is in the midst of a national and spiritual crisis. He's facing blasphemy on one hand and sedition and treason on the other hand. And you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't say, well, brothers, what we need to do right now is just, just get on our knees and pray about this. So we can understand how God would lead, guide, and direct us right here. Moses doesn't do that. I think there's something for us to see there by way of application. We need to take care not to use prayer as a cover or a facade for inaction. Or to preserve the status quo. Or to diffuse the situation. Or to in avoid inconvenient duties. Or to delay obedience to God's clear commands. Or to excuse resistance to God. Or to living by his principles. Well, I'm not discouraging prayer. I'm not saying it's unimportant. Let me just quote from Charles Spurgeon, the man, Charles Spurgeon, the man who said, the prayer meeting is the engine room, the powerhouse of the church. This is what uh, good old Chuck Spurgeon said. There are times when prayer itself is out of season. When we have prayed over a matter to a certain degree, it then becomes sinful to tarry any longer. Our plain duty is to carry out these desires into action. 
And having asked God's guidance and having received divine power from on high to go at once to our duty without any longer deliberation or delay. When our duty is clear, it's time to do it. Well, what does that mean practically? Well, it means that we live out our prayers, doesn't it? We look for ways in which our prayers can be the means, our actions can be the means by which our prayers are answered. Uh, we've talked about that before. The Apostle James condemns those who have the means to serve a brother in Christ, but simply pray that that person will be warm and well fed. What does that mean in our own national situation currently? We live in a country that for generations has, has, a, has had a low regard for human life. And the nation is reaping the harvest of that wickedness that it has sown for generations. And it is a bitter harvest. What are things that you can do to encourage those around you to value the life of all people, regardless of the level of melanin in their skin, regardless of the amount of drugs in their system, regardless of whether he or she complied quickly with police commands? A biblical view of human life and dignity requires us to place a much higher value on human life than what is currently demonstrated in this country. The Bible values human life. Remember, the Bible has a castle doctrine. If someone breaks into your house at night, you can use deadly force. Remember how God limits that use of deadly force in daylight. He says you need to use restraint. You need to bring a thief, a would-be thief, to the judges. You need to use proportional force because you can assess the situation differently in daylight than at nighttime. Why is that? Because God values human life. Even the lives of criminals. They have inherent dignity in his sight. It's just one of the ways God's ways are so much higher than our ways. We've seen shocking things the last couple of weeks. A police officer up north slowly asphyxiating a man in handcuffs while other policemen hold him down. A group of police officers encounter a man, an old man, a veteran, walking with a cane, slowly walking away, complying with their commands, looking a little confused, and they take their shields and they shove him down. A police chief weeping because protesters are preventing fire trucks from reaching a house that is set ablaze with children still inside. As Christians, we need to grieve over this reckless disregard for human life by those in authority in this country and by those who are protesting. We need to pray that God will pour out a spirit of repentance and cries for mercy. What are the things we can do in addition to praying? Can you have conversations with your children and grandchildren, with your friends and with your neighbors about the inherent dignity of all people? Can you treat People of all sorts who, because of their culture or their attitude or their politics, you would be inclined to view those sorts of people as deplorable. But instead, can you treat them with honor and dignity because they are made in God's image? Can you make sure your elected officials know you want to live in a country, in a state, in a city, in a county where life is precious, inside the womb and out? When people around you make callous caricatures or stereotypes or bring up old grievances that they have with certain types of people, can you graciously correct them rather than remaining silent? We live in a time in which race, really ethnicity, because there's just human race, when ethnicity is at the forefront of the American mind, and many of us are perplexed about what to do. We have divided feelings. At least I do. You know, on the one hand, the organization, Black Lives Matter, is a Marxist organization. But you cannot be a Christian, you cannot believe the Bible and support a Marxist organization. But on the other hand, we as Christians should affirm even more loudly that the lives of our black neighbors, colleagues, fellow citizens do matter. And so where there is systematic injustice and deliberate injustice against any people, any people, Christians should be deeply troubled by that, because our God is a God of justice, right? But my concern for us is that we may have a tendency to use prayer 
as an excuse to do nothing more because we're afraid people might call us Marxists or liberals or even the D word if we say or do something. Yes, we should pray without ceasing, but prayer should never keep us from action when the time for obedient action has come. And so Moses does not pray here. He acts, he speaks. What does he do? Look at verses 13 and 14 with me. Moses commands the people, do not fear, stand firm, be silent. I, think, I, really, I really think he should have led with the be silent part, um, but he doesn't. He says, those Egyptians that you are now seeing, you will never see them again. He tells the people, you do nothing. This, that is a time for them to do nothing. And why did Moses do this? He didn't have a word from God right here to specifically respond to Israel's pleas, does he? No, what is Moses doing? He's responding out of what he already knows is true about God. He's experienced God's faithfulness in the past. He has God's revelation and his word now. And so he speaks out of it. Words of comfort and confidence. And we should see a way of application for our own lives. That God's unchanging word and God's faithfulness in the past can give confidence in his continued care now. In times of affliction and sorrow and in times of comfort and peace. Let's look at verses 15 and 16, an impossible command. Moses is doing so well, isn't he? He's, he, he's, he's being completely faithful here. He's, he's so changed from where he was just ch ten chapters ago. But what does God say to Moses? Words of rebuke in verse 15. He doesn't rebuke Israel, God doesn't. The you here is, is, is singular. He says, why do you, Moses, why do you cry to me? What has Moses done to earn this rebuke? The answer is nothing. Moses has done nothing to earn this rebuke. He receives this rebuke because he is the covenant mediator between God and God. And Israel. He is Israel's representative. And in that role, Moses receives what Israel deserves, or in this case, just a mild rebuke, not what Israel deserves. Even though in this regard, Moses has acted with complete righteousness and faithfulness. The people he represents, though, have been faithless. They are the ones crying out to God, wanting to have a prayer meeting instead of acting faithfully, trusting God, and moving forward. And so God's rebuke of Moses here shows Moses was right not to pray at this time. Why do you cry to me? Is God's question. Go forward. Don't miss the connection between verse 10 and verse 15 as God uses the word cry again. Moses receives the rebuke the old covenant church has earned for their lack of faithful action. So we need to see a way of application. How Moses as mediator between God and Israel prepares us for the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. As our mediator, God helps us to understand the legal framework for what God has accomplished in Christ. Now Moses will fail as covenant mediator, won't he, in times to come. And that will show us the need for a better mediator who will not fail. The Lord Jesus Christ was given to be that perfect mediator who is fully qualified to represent both God and man. Fully able to suffer the penalty for the sins of his people and fully able to reveal God's grace and truth. To mankind. Hebrews 3. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house. If indeed we hold fast to our confidence and our boasting in our hope. And so Moses is rebuked. But then a miracle is commanded. God commands Israel to go forward. That is into the sea. But that's impossible. They cannot do what they are commanded to do. And that's the point here. Even their obedience is entirely dependent on God's graciously giving Israel what they need. After God gives the command, then God tells them how they will be able to obey. God displays his power through another miracle, dividing the sea before them, and Israel will pass through on dry ground. Dry ground, that, that's the opposite of sea, right? 
In fact, the same expression is used in Genesis 1-9 to distinguish the land, the earth, from the heavens and the earth from the sea. Notice it turns into dry ground. It does not turn into a soggy morass. It turns into dry ground. This is a miracle. It's also an act of decreation, uncreation. And Moses is alluding to the fact that Israel is God's new creation. His new people, a new nation, who will exist to fulfill the purpose of humanity. For God to dwell in their midst and to glorify him, testifying to his grace. But we need to see again by way of application that Israel can only obey if God grants the ability. If God grants a miracle to enable this obedience. This is the way it is in every instance of God's salvation. Jesus commanded people to repent, to turn away from sin, and to believe God's gracious covenant promises of good news to sinners. But even, even those commands are humanly impossible. Repent and believe. We cannot do that of our own power. We can do nothing to save ourselves unless God gives a new heart and a new mind, miraculously enabling us to be born again so we can come to Christ. If you would leave off sin, you must cry out to God. You must seek his miraculous strength and power to enable you to live by faith. Well, destruction is foretold in verses 17 to 20. It's a fourfold doom. God announces he will again harden the wrath and anger and hatred and resolve of the Egyptians so that they will come close for their own destruction as they chase after Israel. God will glorify himself fourfold over Pharaoh, over his whole army, his hosts, over his chariot corps, and over his cavalry. <clears throat> The purpose of this is made clear in verse 18, so that they will confess, so that they will know, I am Yahweh. This is all about God's glory. So that the dying thoughts, the dying words of the Egyptians will be consumed with Yahweh and his greatness. God is justly going to drown the chariots and cavalry of the Egyptians in righteous retribution for Pharaoh's genocide of the Hebrew infants as God glorifies his justice. This is all about God's glory here. And we need to see by way of application that God's glory, even his glorious justice, God's glory is not just an Old Testament idea. There are all sorts of, of hermeneutics for reading the scripture. Hermeneutics, what is, what is the Bible about? What guides your understanding of Scripture? That's what hermeneutics means. Whole books have been written on hermeneutics. Is it Christ-centered? Is it redemptive historical? Is it grammatical historical? Is it moralistic? Is it allegorical? And we could spend decades, centuries debating that subject. But we can cut to the quick. What is the Bible about? The Bible is about God's glory. That's not only the meaning of life. Why did God make you in all things for his own glory? The Bible is also all about God's glory. What man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. God's glory. If you turn to Philippians 2, you see clearly that the New Testament is primarily concerned with the glory of God. Philippians 2, beginning at verse 8. And being found in human form, Christ humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, giving him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God saves glorify himself in the Old Testament and the New Testament. At the end of time, all people will confess that he, Jesus, is Lord, just as these Egyptians are doing right now as they are plunged beneath the waves. God makes a plentiful defense of his people, doesn't he, in verses 19 and 20. As God prepares for the doom of of the Egyptians, he stands between Israel and their enemies to guard his people. 
the angel of God, the messenger of God. Is this the incarnate, pre-incarnate Christ, as some have claimed? Maybe. I don't know. There's certainly evidence to that the fact, but the scripture is unclear. The pillar of cloud and fire also stand between Israel and Egypt, marking out God's people as distinct from the world, as the children of light, separated from the army of darkness. And here God terrorizes his enemies as he comes in glory to comfort his saints. Well, verses 21 to 29, baptisms are administered. First, the baptism of Israel, verses 21, 22, and 29. Moses' actions here are recorded four times, and the crossing of Israel is likewise recorded twice. I think it's to make sure we don't miss it. I mean, these people are wandering around in the desert. Papyrus would eventually become in short supply. So Moses records it four times, and, then, and twice, so that we don't miss it. It's as if God knew his people would doubt that this event actually took place. As if, as if God knew his people would try to explain away the miraculous character of the event. So it's recorded four times, six times in the command, and then Moses doing it, and then Israel doing it. Moses is commanded by God, stretch out your hand, and the waters are divided in the night by the wind. An east wind from the opposite shore. It dries out the ocean floor so Israel can cross easily. Notice this is not merely the product of the tide going out or coming in. This is clearly presented as a miracle. If you look at 1 Corinthians 10, the, the passing through the waters was Israel's baptism into Moses. The dawn of a new phase of Israel's life as a nation. As, their, as those people enter into a new phase of God's salvation through the waters of the Red Sea. The covenant promises of safety, blessing, presence, and inheritance, all of, our, all of them are signified and sealed in that baptism. As God's cloud shields them from Egypt's armies and brings them without any loss to the far side of the sea. On the way to the promised land and out of Egypt forever. But it remains to be seen, will Israel grasp the promises by faith? Live by those promises. Or will Israel seek blessing and satisfaction elsewhere? The Apostle Paul reminds us the same salvation fundamentally is offered to us. 1 Corinthians 10. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed to the sea. And were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them in the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might desi not desire evil as they did. As we'll see shortly, the first generation of Israel doubted God's promises and God's lordship, and as a result, they perished in the wilderness. But the Apostle Paul says to us, says to the church at Corinth, this is not an Old Testament thing. The Apostle goes on to warn the church at Corinth to flee all temptation and instead find refuge and blessing in Christ. That's the same for us. Will we embrace the salvation that is symbolized and shown forth in baptism and proclaimed in the gospel, turning from sin, taking refuge in the gospel? That God may spare us the wages of our sin. Well, here at the Red Sea, Israel finds safety through this baptism. But then the baptism of Egypt. The whole day is portrayed as a mighty miracle of God. It's not, again, that Israel crossed at low tide when their marshy northern part of the sea was only six inches deep. Look, if that's your explanation for this, you might as well quit. Uh, because God clearly intended this to be understood as a miracle. Although, as others have noted, to drown the Egyptian cavalry squadrons in six inches of water would be rather miraculous, unless they were Lilliputians. It's a Lilliputian cavalry, I don't know. Uh, but that's not what happened. They did not drown in six inches of water. The Egyptian forces are held back for a time. 
But when Israel reaches the safety of the Asian shore, they are allowed to resume their pursuit. Now, you see in, in Exodus that it's only the mobile forces that pursue Israel, only the cavalry, the horses, and the chariots. They would quickly overtake Israel and threaten them with bondage and death. But God throws them into a panic, doesn't he? He causes their chariots to, to fall apart, to drive heavy, and to slow down. And the Egyptians, they come to know who is doing this. Yahweh, the God of the Hebrew slaves, is fighting against them. And their gods are powerless to save. Their words are a confession of Yahweh's power. When, when the Egyptians are past the point of no return, God commands Moses, stretch out your hand again. And the waters return to their normal place at dawn, at daybreak, when morning appears. Why at morning? Well, because God is showing that first generation of Israel, showing the Israelites, Ra, the God of the sun, who has just come back up from the underworld, Ra is powerless to save his people. And so God is not only judging the Egyptians for their sins against his people, he's judging their gods. As the Egyptians are immersed in the waters of baptism, of judgment, and death because of their lack of faith and their wickedness. And so we need to see a way of application. This, too, is a baptism, a baptism of judgment in which the wicked are immersed and never to rise again, submerged between the waves of judgment and wrath because of their obstinate persistence in sin. And this, too, is a warning for us, isn't it? Will we receive the gracious mercy of God and escape his judgment? Israel looks back on this event for centuries as the defining act of God's saving work. The same water that brought salvation for Israel brought judgment to their enemies. Likewise, the Apostle Paul comforts Christians by urging us to look back to what Christian baptism points. Dying and being buried and rising with Christ as he took on the judgment and the condemnation for our sins. Freed us from the condemnation that they deserve and sprinkled clean water on his people to purify us for his own possession and delight. And so salvation is received. Verses 30 and 31. God's victory is total, isn't it, in verse 30? The Egyptian corpses soon start washing up on the shore in view of Israel. Moses promised Israel would never see those Egyptians again, though, didn't he? Has God's word through Moses failed? Israel was promised. You, you, these people who are so menacing to you, who are triggering you, you'll, you'll, never, you'll never see them again. But there they are. Has God's word failed? Well, no. I, did God not know this was going to happen? No. I think this is an instance of God doing better than he promised. If someone says to you, I'm going to pay off your car. How much, how much do you owe? And then you, and you tell, tell him. And he says, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll be back in an hour. And then he comes back in an hour and he said, look, I'm not going to pay off your car. I'm going to pay off your house. Here's a check for the balance. Would you say, you're a liar? No, here is an instance of God doing better than what he promised. Israel does not merely never see these Egyptians again and wonder what happened to them, but sees what has become of all their enemies. They are drowned beneath the flood so that Israel may go forward in safety and in God's triumph. Psalm 118, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in God than to trust in man. What is Israel's response here? Here they respond with a measure of faith, with worship, with trust, because they have looked in triumph on all their foes. And all they did was receive God's salvation. As we'll see next, the Lord said, the first thing they do is, is sing to God's praise. Sing about the kind of God they have. As God shows us his glorious salvation and invites us to receive it and respond to it with grateful praise to him. 
because of what he has done for his people in Christ. Let's pray. God in heaven, we thank you for what you have done, that you have made us yours, sparing us the judgment we deserve, and giving us your riches. Would you bless us with full assurance of faith? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and respond to God's word by singing, It is well with my soul. Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please be seated. We'll, uh, we'll dismiss by Rose. Um, start back here. Thank you for moving and sitting over there. If people want to stay in the parking lot, that's...